Hello, I'm Alma Angeles, and you're watching Eagle News International. Here are tonight's headlines. A storm tore through a massive Amazon warehouse in the U.S. state of Illinois on Friday, according to officials, with local media reporting around 100 workers were trapped inside. China branded U.S. democracy a weapon of mass destruction following the U.S. organized summit for democracy which aimed to shore up like-minded allies in the face of autocratic regimes. The Japanese government will refrain from sending a cabinet minister to the Winter Olympics in Beijing to align itself with the U.S. and others who already announced diplomatic boycotts, according to government sources. Nelson normally and Echo Ortelesa Quiñola shares with us the story of a Filipino art toy creator in Papua New Guinea who says the inspirations behind his masterpieces, Astro and October, are his co-art toy creators, his daily experiences, and his family. Basically. First in our news. At least 50 people are dead after a tornado ripped through a south in southeastern U.S. state of Kentucky. Its governor told reporters a storm ravaged large swathes of the country. Several counties in Kentucky were devastated, with the strongest tornado tearing 200 miles through the state. According to Governor Andy Beshear, the governor said a roof collapsed at a candle factory, resulting in mass casualties in the city of Mayfield. And before midnight, he declared, a state of emergency. The tornado came as storms wreaked havoc in multiple U.S. states. A storm tore through the massive uh, Amazon warehouse in Illinois, according to officials, with the local media reporting that around 100 workers were trapped inside. Officials were working through the early hours of Saturday to rescue the employees at the facility, a third of which was reduced to rubble who were on the night shift processing orders ahead of the holidays. The Collinsville Emergency Management Agency described it as a mass casualty incident with multiple subjects trapped at Amazon Warehouse. A tornado warning had been in effect in the area at the time of the incident. In Arkansas, one person was killed, 20 others were trapped after a tornado struck the Monette Manor, Manor Nursing Home, according to U.S. media. In Tennessee, an emergency management official told local media that at least two people were killed in storm-related incidents. And take a look at these images showing flood, flooded roads and submerged vehicles after heavy rains flooded parts of the Spanish city of Pamplona as heavy rains from Storm Barra caused rivers to burst their banks. Take a look. According to a Reuters report, police said one person in the small village of San Bilia died on Friday afternoon after a landslide caved in the roof of an outbuilding at their farmhouse. In the regional capital of Pamplona, people kayaked down the street, gliding past the bank as rescue workers waded into the waist-deep waters with pumps. In the center of Villava, a small town just outside the city, houses were submerged up to their roofs. In an CBC report, meanwhile, it said that after a cold snap sent temperatures plunging across Spain, Storm Barra has brought torrential rains and thawed snow and ice at higher altitudes, causing the rivers to rise rapidly. Meanwhile, rivers overflowed their banks across a large swathe of southwest France on Friday after heavy rains lashed the region overnight, leading to evacuations of dozens of residents. Warm southern winds that have melted snowbanks in the Pyrenees Mountains in recent days also contributed to the flooding, which could persist for several days. The Matteo France Weather Agency also warned of high avalanche risks in the Pyrenees, which separate France from Spain, where local flooding was also reported. The regional government in Spain's Navarre region said a woman died on Friday in her car after a landslide that followed two weeks of heavy rains. Eric Spitz, the French government's top official for the Aquitaine region, that includes Berdu, said that while the situation was under control, forecasts of more rain to come could see flood waters 
rise further in several towns and cities. And we have more extreme weather in Sudan. UN Special Representative in South Sudan, Nicholas Haysom, visited Bentiu to see firsthand the work being done to assist some 850,000 people who have been affected by flooding in the Unity State. 70% of South Sudan's Unity State is now underwater because of the worst floods in 60 years. Let's listen in. Even as we speak, the water is continuing to rise. Um, and they are saying now that the natural evaporation of the water will take 15 years. So natural evaporation is not an option. Uh, we're going to have to find a way of allowing people to return to their lives um, and, and connect to livelihoods uh, and be able to uh, return to their places of origin and, as dignified return. We need to ensure as a short term that for the short term measures we are able to hold on all these places which are dry today. And then moving forward we have to also think that these are the four or five months we are left with. So we need to pump in some more resources and recover those or reclaim those areas which are like urgently required by the population which have been displaced like the Rupkona village or the markets area. My message to the international community would be to help and if they have any doubts about the scale of the crisis and the dramatic way in which it has affected people's lives, come here and have a look. I can only promise that as UNMIS we're going to do our best to deal with this problem. I think we all have an interest in, as it were, the normalization of South Sudan and in creating the conditions for people to have normal lives. Uh, don't, you know, I would encourage South Sudanese not to give up hope on that prospect. While the uh, human impact is immense, wildlife is also suffering. Cheetahs and other natural predators have infiltrated the displacement camps to escape the floods and find food. Cheetahs are trapped in tiny makeshift cages because of the threat they pose to human life. There is no food for them and nowhere safe to release them. Massive investment in infrastructure is needed to prevent this crisis from becoming a catastrophe. The local government wants to construct 300 kilometers of permanent dikes. If dry land is not reclaimed to support crops and livestock, people will continue to rely on humanitarian relief. 70% of South Sudan's unity state is now underwater because of the worst floods in 60 years and until now war intercommunal fighting cattle raiding sexual violence and displacement and the dire economic situation had been the dominant concerns in the country but also there is growing realization of the very real and present threat posed by climate change to lives and the prospects of recovery First, let's uh, look at a roundup of stories from the U.S., Canada, and Latin America. Eliza Gonzalez Manglikmot leads the stories. Thanks, Alma. On December 9, U.S. President Joe Biden opened the first ever Summit for Democracy. A forum of leaders from across the globe began the discussion on what faces democracy in the 21st century. In line with the summit's aim in his opening statement, President Biden said democracy, an ongoing struggle, needs champions because achieving it doesn't happen overnight. Take a look. And welcome to the first Summit for Democracy. This gathering has been on my mind for a long time for a simple reason. In the face of sustained and alarming challenges to democracy, universal human rights, and all around the world, democracy needs champions. And I wanted to host this summit because here, is the, uh, here in the United States, we know as well as anyone that renewing our democracy and strengthening our democratic institutions requires constant effort. 
President Biden announced a landmark set of policy and foreign assistance programs called the Presidential Initiative for Democratic Renewal. The U.S. plans to allocate $424 million toward the initiative subject to availability of appropriations. In a statement, the White House says the following five areas of work will be the focal points of the initiative. Supporting free and independent media, fighting corruption, bolstering democratic reformers, advancing technology for democracy, and defending free and fair elections and political processes. Meanwhile, it is dangerous for children. This is an accusation social media apps are currently facing, and Instagram has not been spared from having to answer it. We have Mayan Manzana Guerzon to tell us more. Mayan? Instagram's boss, Adam Mosseri, faces U.S. lawmakers based on leaked internal research showing the photo-sharing app is toxic for children. The documents leaked to reporters, lawmakers and regulators by Facebook whistleblower Francis Hogan include research from 2019 that found Instagram makes body image issues worse for one in three teenage girls. Another report from 2020 revealed that 32 percent of teenage Teenage girls said that when they felt bad about their bodies, Instagram made it worse. I don't believe the research suggests that our products are addictive. Research actually shows that on 11 of 12 difficult issues that teens face, teens are struggling, said Instagram helps more than harms. Now, we always care about how people feel about their experiences on our platform, and it's my responsibility as head of Instagram to do everything I can to help keep people safe, and we're going to continue to do so. Facebook, however, argues that the research was mischaracterized. Facebook has bounced back from other scandals, like the one involving Cambridge Analytica, a British consulting firm that used the personal data of millions of Facebook users to target political ads, where CEO Mark Zuckerberg apologized and agreed to a $5 billion settlement with U.S. regulators. Instagram now faces a new investigation spurred by the latest crisis for enticing young users and the potential resulting harms which have rekindled a push for U.S. regulation. On the eve of hearing, Instagram announced new protections for young users, suggesting a break if they have been spending a lot of time on the platform and to start nudging teens toward new topics if there is one they have been dwelling on for a while and will stop people from mentioning teens who don't follow them on the platform. Lawmakers, however, voiced skepticism over the platform's capacity to protect kids, as well as the timing of the announcement of the new safety features, questioning whether it was an effort to shift attention and a distraction ahead of the hearing. Mayan Manzano Garzon, Aston, Pennsylvania, Eagle News. Thanks, Mayan. On to COVID news. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has issued a statement on the emergence of Omicron, the newest COVID-19 variant now found in several countries and as of press time in more than 20 states here in America. The number is at 23 to be exact. CDC says the Omicron variant likely will spread more easily than the original SARS-CoV-2 virus and is expected to be spread to others even if they are vaccinated or don't have symptoms. However, CDC says current vaccines against COVID are expected to protect against severe illnesses, hospitalizations and deaths due to infection with the Omicron variant. But breakthrough infections in people People who are fully vaccinated are likely to occur. Effective tools to fight COVID and its variants remain to be vaccination, mask wearing, and COVID-19 testing for current infection or antigens. Meanwhile, CDC says Delta is still the main variant circulating here in the country. In a related story, not backing down from the fight against the pandemic, the District of Columbia hosts another pop-up vaccination and booster shot site. At the Iglesia Ni Cristo location this weekend, more than 400 residents received either their COVID vaccination or their booster shots. Community members say such a collaboration among city leaders and organizations delivers a lasting impact on the district. EJ Gonzalez reports. The campaign to have more people get vaccinated against COVID continues. 
Here today in the nation's capital, the Mayor's Office on Asian and Pacific Islanders Affairs collaborates with the Church of Christ, Iglesia Ni Cristo, in hosting a COVID-19 pop-up vaccine clinic. Not for the first time, but a second time. We are still in the midst of a pandemic, and services like this is beneficial and needed for the communities, most especially during these trying times. It has been almost two years since the pandemic, and now with the presence of the Omicron variant amidst us, uncertainty still remains. But the residents here in the DMV area say community outreach like this gives them a sense of relief. To know that there are services like this accessible to families, including little children. Well, it's not over yet. And uh, there are still uh, variants of the vex of the uh, COVID-19 going around still, as we know. Omicron is the newest. Uh, it's scary. So it's very important that we be covered, the adults, but that the children be covered. And I'm so glad that they're able to be. Uh, we were very happy. My, my son... Um, was absolutely thrilled. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the Church of Christ. They were incredible with our with the kids. They provided coloring books and crayons, and I think that extra touch uh, makes a big difference when the kids are getting vaccinated. So I want to thank them for working with the city to get the vaccine out to um, all communities. According to the CDC and U.S. President Joe Biden, the best defense against the coronavirus and its variants is to get vaccinated. For community leaders here today, the same sentiment resounds. Neighborhoods have come together to feel safe as they protect themselves and their families against the lingering pandemic. Activities for little children, a chance to meet neighbors, and time to bond with other families. Love and concern for the community is indeed an observable fact. No matter what people are going through, it's comforting to know there are those ready to care for each other. Let's all continue to stay safe. EJ Gonzalez, Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Thanks, EJ. In Canada, a drug made to help treat COVID-19 symptoms is on its way to patients as Merck Canada announces the start of manufacturing this oral antiviral medicine. In Toronto, Joshua Santeliana reports. Merck Canada, also known as MSD, announced Monday that it will begin manufacturing Molnupiravir, the company's investigational COVID-19 antiviral drug in partnership with Thermo Fisher Scientific in Whitby, Ontario. Merck is currently developing the drug with Ridgeback Biotherapeutics. Molnupiravir is an oral antiviral medicine aimed to treat COVID-19 in a statement released by Merck during their initial data in October this year, the company claimed that the molnupiravir could reduce the risk of hospitalization by about 50% in COVID-19 patients with mild to moderate symptoms. However, more recent reports sent to the FDA for approval showed that the risk reduction was much lower at about 30%. With the manufacturing of the antiviral pill set to begin, the Government of Canada and Merck entered an agreement for access to 500,000 courses of the treatment, with the possibility of adding 500,000 more in the following year after Health Canada's approval. Alongside this, the Government of Canada also signed an agreement with Pfizer for an initial 1 million courses of their oral antiviral pill for COVID-19. Pfizer has submitted their request for authorization to Health Canada earlier this month. Now let's head over to Panama and see how the country celebrated its bicentennial year of independence. This year, a showcase of bands from across the Republic highlighted the event and residents shared with Eagle News what they look forward to in the years to come. May Davila reports. In commemoration
commemoration of the 200 years of independence of Panama from Spain, the National Government through the Bicentennial Commission, chaired by Carlos Aguilar Navarro, Minister of Culture, successfully carried out the exhibition of independent bands at the Romel Fernandez Gutierrez Stadium. This special event had the participation of outstanding music bands from the provinces of Colón, Cocle, and Panama, who showcased their musical skills with patriotic and popular rhythms. The audience were impressed with their lucid choreography, colorful outfits, and contagious dances. The Metropolitan Band opened the program, accompanied by a group of nurses, with an emotional message. Los superhéroes existen, muchas gracias Cuerpo Médico de Panama, as tribute to our modern-day heroes for their services and sacrifice during this time of pandemic. With the melodies that evoke the great patriotic feeling, 11 independent bands participated to pay tribute to the homeland with their chords and dances, along with the music bands of the National Police and the National Border Service, the Meritorious Fire Department of the Republic of Panama, and the Big Band of the Institutional Protection Service of Panama. The Vice President of the Republic, Jose Gabriel Carizo, along with state ministers and local authorities, participated in this bicentennial celebration. The Vice President was captivated with his patriotic holiday and was invited to be part of the National Independent Band, drawing applause from everyone. Members of the band and spectators were beaming with national pride and patriotic fervor, full of hope for their nation in the next 200 more years. Para mí es un orgullo, tanto orgullo como un honor poder representar a mi, a mi patria desfilando en esta fecha. Orgullosamente panameño y por celebrar el centenario, el centenario es algo que, que no se ve todo el tiempo. Y bueno, orgulloso, orgulloso de ser panameño. Hemos llegado a una fecha histórica, histórica y gracias a, a nuestro señor. Pues lo estamos celebrando. Yo, yo sé que todos los panameños, todos como yo, estamos completamente orgullosos de celebrar esto. Así que esperemos que seguí adelante, seguí adelante. Todo lo que ha estado sucediendo y, y en el mundo entero, pero aquí estamos. Gracias al Señor. Bueno, deseo que todo cambie, que todo sea para bien, que, que ya no haya mucha muerte eh, y ser ser lo más feliz que se pueda, lo más, que seamos felices todos como panameños, unidos más bien. This national event symbolizes the feelings of patriotism, of struggle, of freedom, of peace, and the desire to continue working for a country with the aspirations and the skill of a strong and hardworking nation that does not give up and that always moves forward. That's the latest from this part of the globe. Eliza Gonzalez, Manglik Mott, Eagle News International, Washington, D.C. Back to you, Alma. Thank you, Eliza. Meanwhile, China branded U.S. democracy a weapon of mass destruction following the U.S. Organized Summit for Democracy, which aimed to shore up like-minded allies in the face of autocratic regimes. Take a look. China was left out of the two-day virtual summit, along with countries including Russia and Hungary, and responded by angrily accusing U.S. President Joe Biden of stoking Cold War-era ideological divides. Democracy has long become a weapon of mass destruction used by the U.S. to interfere in other countries, according to Foreign Ministry spokesperson in an online statement which also accused the U.S. of having instigated color revolutions overseas. The ministry also claimed the summit was organized by the U.S. to draw lines of ideological prejudice, instrumentalist, or instrumentalize and weaponize democracy, incite division and confrontation. Taiwan, a democratic self-ruling island that is claimed by China, was invited to the U.S. summit in a clear snub to its larger neighbor. But Beijing got a boost in the middle of Biden's summit when Nicaragua dropped its previous diplomatic alliance with Taiwan, saying it only recognized China. The announcement leaves Taiwan with only 14 diplomatic allies. In response, the U.S. State Department called on all countries that value democratic institutions to expand engagement with the island. 
The United States unveiled a raft of new rights abuse sanctions on senior officials and entities in eight countries, including a Chinese firm specializing in facial recognition technology and a giant cartoon studio in North Korea. Time for International Human Rights Day and supported in part by Britain and Canada, the sanctions took aim at officials accused of abetting the crackdown on anti-coup protesters in Myanmar, the oppression of Muslim Uyghurs in China's Xinjiang region, and the political violence in Bangladesh under the guise of a war on drugs. The U.S. Treasury Department also said China's artificial intelligence company Sense Time and two ethnic Uyghur political leaders in Xinjiang, Shorat Zakir and Erkan Tuniaz, took part in the sweeping oppression of Uyghurs. Now, the sanctions and blacklisting can prevent individuals from obtaining visas to the U.S., block assets under U.S. jurisdiction, and prevent the targets from doing business with U.S. individuals or entities, effectively locking them out of the U.S. banking system. In other news, the Japanese government will remain from sending or will refrain from sending a cabinet minister to the Winter Olympics in Beijing to align itself with the U.S. and others who already announced diplomatic boycotts, according to government sources today. According to the Japan Times, Japan will instead send Yasuhiro Yamashita the president of the Japanese Olympic Committee, according to sources. The government is also mulling whether to send Seiko Hashimoto, the president of the Tokyo Organizing Committee of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, while also discussing whether Koji Murofushi, commissioner of the Japan Sports Agency, should attend the games which are scheduled to begin in February. Japanese athletes are expected to be sent as scheduled. A report by the Yomori Daily Saturday said the government is likely to make a final decision by the end of this year. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's administration is facing rising pressure from in and out of Japan to join the U.S.-led diplomatic boycott. Prime Minister Kishida plans to wait and see how other countries will respond before making a decision. And the news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Welcome back. We go now to Israel where the country has imposed new travel restrictions due to the emergence of the Omicron variant. We have an update from EBC correspondent in Israel, Judith Amos. Judith. Earlier 
November, Israel opened the country to all tourists for the first time in 18 months due to the pandemic. But the Omicron variant has pushed the country once again to ban the entry to the country starting November 28. The Omicron variant, or formerly known as B11529, is designated as a variant of concern by the World Health Organization. Researchers across the world have been pointing to the variant having an unusually large number of mutations. As of December 8, Israel has 21 confirmed cases of the Omicron variant. The people who have been infected with the Omicron variant will be required to spend 14 days in isolation. There were also 651 new confirmed carriers of virus as of December 7, according to the Ministry of Health of Israel. At the same time, the number of serious patients continued to decline, dropping to 102 a week ago is at 116. For now, Israel has strictly placed its barriers to any foreigner unless they receive special permissions from the government panel. All returnees have to quarantine for a minimum of seven days, including the first day in a coronavirus hotel until the first PCR taken upon landing returns negative. For those who land in the country without taking a second PCR test prior to their flight will be charged 2,500 shekels. At the moment, Israel is expected to reopen on December 13, 2021. From Israel, I am Judith Imus. We live in interesting times. To Hong Kong now, where the city will require inbound travelers from the United States to spend seven days at a government quarantine camp after a passenger coming from the U.S. tested positive for the Omicron variant of COVID-19. The new rules, which comes into effect Monday, means that travelers from the U.S. will be subject to the highest tier of quarantine measures in the semi-autonomous city, which has some of the strictest anti-COVID policies in the world. They will also make the U.S. The, the first country outside of Africa to be placed under a quarantine center order since the Omicron variant was first detected last month. Travelers from the U.S. will only be allowed to enter the city if they are fully vaccinated. Hong Kong residents will be required to spend their first seven days at a quarantine center with daily testing and health monitoring. Afterwards, they will need to spend another 14 days in quarantine at a hotel booked in advance. U.S. travelers entering Hong Kong are already required to quarantine for a total of 21 days, but under current rules, they can remain in a hotel for the duration of their isolation. The Hong Kong government said Friday it would tighten its rules after confirming a new Omicron case, the city's fifth, involving a 37-year-old man arriving from the U.S. The Swiss Medicines Agency, Swiss Medic, approved the vaccination of children aged between 5 and 11 with Pfizer, BioNTech's Comir Nati va vaccine. Clinical trial results show that the vaccine is safe and effective in this age group. It said in a statement, the Comirnaty vaccine is administered in two doses of 10 micrograms, three weeks apart. An ongoing clinical trial of more than 1,500 people shows that the COVID-19 vaccine offers almost complete protection against serious illness caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus in 5 to 11-year-olds, it said. The vaccinations were, until now, limited to children age 12 or older. Switzerland is currently experiencing a strong wave, a strong fifth wave of the virus. Only the Comirnaty and Moderna vaccine are authorized in Switzerland. The country joins Portugal, Italy, Greece and Spain and Europe in giving the green light to the vaccination of children in this age group. Meanwhile, in the United Kingdom, the country saw the highest number of COVID infections since January, according to a senior minister Friday, as the government seeks to slow the spread of the new variant. Take a look. 
Community Secretary Michael Gov said that the country faces a deeply concerning situation as the Omicron variant spreads rapidly, with case numbers doubling every two to three days in England. The UK said it had a total of 58,194 cases on Friday. Mr. Gov said that 30% of reported cases in London are now the Omicron variant, while the virus was only identified in the UK two weeks ago. The UK Health Security Agency said that if the trend continues, it expects Omicron to become the dominant variant in the UK by mid-December. The UK HSA also said that uh, early analysis of around 500 people confirmed to be infected with Omicron showed that AstraZeneca and Pfizer jabs provided much lower levels of protection against symptomatic infection in comparison to the Delta variant. A booster dose appeared to uh, considerably increase this protection to 70 to 75 percent, it said, while cautioning such small sample sizes should be treated with caution. The government has decided to resume regular international passenger flights on a pilot basis from January 1 next year in Vietnam in a, bud, in a bid to boost economic recovery, according to its government website, VGP. The decision of Vietnam was announced on Friday following a meeting chaired by Permanent Deputy Prime Minister Pam Minh Binh on Thursday to discuss a plan on resumption of regular international passenger flights proposed by the Ministry of Transport. Accordingly, first flights will be resumed to and from highly safe countries and territories. And this will be Beijing, Guangzhou, China, Tokyo, uh, Seoul, Taiwan, Bangkok, Singapore, Vientiane in Laos, Phnom Penh in Cambodia, San Francisco, Los Angeles, in the U.S. And Vietnam closed its uh, borders to foreign vis visitors or tourists from March last year, allowing only its nationals, foreign experts, investors, and highly skilled workers to enter. In other news, Mexico on Friday urged Washington to rethink its migration policy after a horror road accident killed 55 undocumented migrants in a truck on a major transit route to the United States. Such tragedies, Mexican President Andres Manuel López López Obrador said Friday, should move the world to address the underlying problem and despair. The migration problem, he said, cannot be solved by coercive measures, but by opportunities for work and well-being. People don't leave their villages for pleasure. They do it out of necessity, he said. If the United States wanted to prevent migration to its shores, added Lopez Obrador, it should invest in social programs in Central Africa, a matter he has discussed with President Joe Biden. But there is slowness, said the Mexican leader. The victims of Thursday's accident, authorities said, were from Guatemala, Honduras, Ecuador, the Dominican Republic, and Mexico. Most of the dead were from Guatemala. And the news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang pagharap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. Hatid namin ang dekalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka ng mga mba, sasamahan ka namin tuparin ang mga pangarap niya. Maaasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon. May lalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, mga kasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa new era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. 
kasama mo kami sa bawat niti at tagumpay. Welcome back. More than 100 overseas Filipino workers have been deployed to South Korea under the Host Nations Employment Permit System, or EPS, this month, according to the Philippine Overseas Labor Office, or POLO. Take a look. Ma malugod po namin binabalita no, na ang total na pong nakarating dito sa Korea simula po nitong uh, pagpasok ng buwan ay 158. Uh, ito po ay susundan ngayong darating na lunes muli, no, December 13, ng another 51. So kung susumahin po natin, sir, yung tatlong batches na yon, magkakaroon po tayo ng 209 workers na nakapasok na simula po ng nag-lift uh, ng entry restriction ang South Korea. Valderrama reported that the manufacturing industry has the highest number of Filipino workers or EPS workers, numbering 21,546. And uh, about 90% of them are in manufacturing, she said. The companies are involved in the production of plastic, rubber, metal, furniture, food, and food supplements. Valderrama also noted that some OFWs are in the performing arts sector and occupations that require special skills, while some are employed as household service workers. Some Filipinos work in shipping companies, while some Filipino engineers work as car seat designers for companies. The latest data from the Polo showed a total of 47,392 Filipinos in South Korea as of October this year. South Korea implemented entry restrictions in June last year due to the pandemic. In November, Seoul announced that it would allow the entry of foreign workers under the EPS from the Philippines, Myanmar, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan. In the U.S., consumer prices rose last month at a rate not seen in nearly 40 years, according to the government report Friday, underscoring how inflation threatens the world's largest economy and President Joe Biden's public support. The Labor Department's Consumer Price Index, or CPI, jumped 6.8 percent compared to November of last year, its biggest gain since 1982 of June, as prices for gasoline, used cars, rent, food and other goods continue to climb. First, let's listen in. Yes, prices are going up extremely. And I'd be so glad when they come down. You know, due to the COVID, people don't have money. We just starting back to work and stuff like that. This is outrageous with the prices of the gas today. I'm not going to say that because Joe Biden has done a lot for the people. To my opinion, this is my opinion. He has done a lot for the people. But I still think politicians can do better. They can do better. I, I, you know, I got a truck, so you know the gas prices is really high for me. So uh, some days I, I have to like borrow money to get to work. Yeah, for about seventy dollars, I could fill my tank back then. But now it's like a hundred and ten dollars. Uh, you know, and I start looking for sales and online shopping more than I normally would have. I like to walk in, buy my stuff, and get out. But now I have to be a more frugal shopper. Yeah, I mean, but it seems like it's incremental across the board, so you don't really notice it until you know you're you're looking at your statements later on. But uh. um, when I used to go to the grocery store, I wasn't as conscious about prices. Like I would just, if I needed a bag of spinach, I would just grab a bag without really looking at the price as much. Um, and now I'm doing more like cost comparison between different brands, so just a little bit more aware when I'm in the store. All right. Gasoline prices rose 6.1 percent. Gasoline prices rose 6.1 percent last month, while prices of used cars climbed 2.5 percent, according to the Consumer Price Index report. However, those were both the same increases as in October. While the report contains signs that the inflation wave may be reaching a crest, it nonetheless poses a political liability for the president, with the Republican opposition using it to argue against his economic. 
economic policies. President Biden countered that report that the report did not encompass recent declines in prices of energy and used cars, two main drivers of the high inflation readings seen this year, and that supply chain issues, which have driven prices higher, are being resolved. A variety of factors have caused the price increases. That includes shortages of components and workers, high demand for goods, and rebounds in industries that were disrupted by the pandemic but are now recovering with the help of vaccines. Eagle News will be right back. Stay tuned. Next week, sa tara, ating pasyalan. Dahil napakalaki ng lalawigan ng Japan, napakarami pang magandang destinasyon dito ang hindi pa natin napapasyalan. Marami pang pagkain ang hindi pa natin natitikman. Kaya hindi pa rin natatapos ang ating pamasyal. Tara, ating pasyalan ang bayan na nasa pinakadulong bahagi ng Quezon, ang San Andres. Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Welcome back. Echo Hortelesa Quinola shares with us the story of a Filipino art toy creator in Papua New Guinea who says the inspirations behind his masterpieces, Astro and October, are his co-art toy creators, his daily experiences, and his family. Echo? A Filipino art toy maker is presently making a big name in the so-called designer's toy industry here in Papua New Guinea. Nelson Hoxon, a graphic artist and a music enthusiast, shares with us his passion in creating art toys. These self-made toys are typically in a very limited edition, making them highly valuable collector's items. Nelson normally uses wood, vinyl metal, latex, paints, and other materials for designing his creations. He also makes use of his random sketches to come up with his original creative design. Most of my art toys are basically comes from uh, random thoughts. And for my Astro, uh, it was a random sketch. It's, it became like uh, my outlet for my feelings. Like uh, when I get frustrated or I feel happy, convert it into an Astro and sometimes post it into social media. I decided to why not make it an art toy so everyone can have a piece of my astro. Inspired by his co-designers and with his daily experience and inspiration from his own family, Nelson was able to do collaborative works with other toy artists. His well-known masterpieces are Astro, an astronaut who was asked to lead a group of explorers to go to outer space as well as his latest creation, October, named after making the design in October with a bear as the picture concept. My inspirations are mostly my co 
toy designers, and sometimes uh, daily experiences, and also my family. October just came into my mind, then it's uh, September is going to end and I need something to post. I just play with words and then created the character out of that. Transforming artworks into figurines are emerging to become another interesting avenue in the artistic scene. With these collectibles gaining popularity in these times, budding artists must give this a try. Echo Hortaleza Quinola, Oceania at England's Eagle News. In other news, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin is set to blast its third private crew space today, this time including the daughter of the first American astronaut. Huh? Laura Shepard, Church Lee, whose father, Alan Shepard, became the first American to travel to space in 1961, will be flying as a guest of Blue Origin. Laura Shepard, Church Lee, whose father, Alan Shepard, became the first American to travel to space in 1961, will be flying as a guest. And Alan Shepard performed a 15-minute suborbital space flight back in May 5, 1961, just under a month after the Soviet Union's Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space orbiting the planet. Shepard, who died in 1998, went on to be the fifth of 12 men to have set foot on the moon. Michael Strahan, an American football Hall of Famer turned TV personality, is also a guest. While there are four paying customers, space, uh, space industry executive and philanthropist, Dylan Taylor, investor, Evan Dick, Best Ventures, founder Lane Best and Cameron Best. Lane and Cameron Best will become the first parent-child pair to fly in space. Ticket prices have not been disclosed. The space flight will last roughly 11 minutes, launching from the company's base in Texas and soaring to just beyond the internationally recognized boundary of space, which is 62 miles high. The six-member crew will unbuckle and enjoy a few minutes weightlessness before the spaceship returns to Earth for a gentle parachute landing in the desert. The launch date was pushed back because of high winds, but it's now set for 8.45 a.m. local time today. Previous Blue Origin flights have flown the company's billionaire founder Bezos, as well as Star Trek actor William Shatner, to space. More space news. Philip Toledo tells us about the newest space mission set to explore the most dramatic objects in the universe. Take a look. Have you ever wanted to have x-ray vision just like Superman? Well, maybe we don't have a way to have that ourselves just yet. But NASA is using something similar to explore what they call the universe's most dramatic objects. On Thursday morning, NASA launched its Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, or XB, aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. XB is embarking on a two-year mission to measure the polarization of X-rays to study some of the most mysterious objects in the universe, such as supernova remnants, black holes, and other high-energy objects. This will enable scientists to study, quote, the violent universe around us in ways we've never been able to see it. In this clip right here, you can see Ixby separating from the rocket to begin its mission, and the solar arrays that power the minivan-sized spacecraft are starting to unfurl. You can also see the telescopes there at the end, made of mirrors that will collect X-rays and focus them on detectors. Now, you might be wondering, how does this all work? Well, simply, according to NASA, X-rays are a high-energy form of light made up of waves that vibrate in different directions as they travel through space in an often chaotic manner, especially, as an example, when coming from an exploded star. When light is polarized, however, it vibrates in one direction, similar to what you might see from the reflective glare of the sun shining on a lake. Ixby's detectors will measure this polarization to help scientists with their research to solve some of the mysteries of the universe we might only think are possible in science fiction. Are you curious to see what the massive black hole at the center of our galaxy looks like? Well, check out frequent updates and more information at nasa.gov slash Ixpe, I-X-P-E. Philip Toledo, Learning Curve, Eagle News.
That's it for tonight's broadcast. As I always say, at the end of the day, there remains so much more to be grateful for. I'm Alma Angeles. We live in interesting times. Napapansin ba ninyo, lumiliwanag ang mundo pag magkasama tayo? Life is so much sweeter, everything feels better, pag tayong lahat ay together. Let's have fun together, let's play together, kumain, magluto, matuto together, tawanan together, hawak kamay together, we'll be there for each other, we're stronger together. Together, let's all go.